on. They wanted to share the scriptures that have meaning to them and to their marriage relationship. And, um, and so I wanted to, to focus on those. And, you know, they're, they're, they're beautiful scriptures and they contain dynamic truths, both of the love that's, that's to be found in marriage as, as well as the great redeeming love that God has for his people as expressed and demonstrated in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where God ultimately um, uh, displays and demonstrates his cross, uh, his, his love is in the cross. Scripture says that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the love that God pours into the hearts of those who are followers of Jesus, as spoken of in Romans chapter 5, that love is the love as demonstrated in the cross of Christ. Just this week, I was um, meditating on Psalm 22. Psalm 22 by, by David is the psalm that um, Jesus quotes when he's on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course, I think most of us understand that because Jesus, when he died on the cross, that he bore the judgment and the wrath that our sins deserved so that you and I would never face judgment as believers in him. That that's what he was experiencing when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he cries that out in our place so that we'll never have to cry that out for all eternity. We'll be able to gaze into his face, know him and know his love, which we will be talking about. But a, a different thought came to my mind that I'd never really thought of before when reading that verse. And that's the fact that Jesus Christ is the one human being and the only human being that really could cry out, why have you forsaken me? You see, we may at times experience and no doubt do the absence of God. And you see throughout the Psalms, the psalmists crying out, where are you? Um, the psalmist in Psalm 83 says, why do you stand idly by, O oh God, mute and inactive? And I think we all feel that way at times. Like, I'm going through a difficult time, Lord, where are you? But, you know, we experience that because we have been alienated from God because we are fallen. And every one of us, the scripture says, has sinned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've each gone our own way. We've turned away from God. We are inherently sinners born into that. So it's not unusual that we wouldn't know his presence. The Bible says of Jesus, he was the one person without sin, totally righteous, always, always deserving of God's full countenance. The only man that's ever lived that's been able to actually say, why have you forsaken me? He knew in his heart that he was going to the cross, but still in his humanity, he's the one person that could say that. If you understand what I mean, praise God. So I wanted to share that. It's exciting as we look at the redemptive love of Almighty God. Um, the first three scriptures are scriptures that Ken had suggested. And um, this is what a godly marriage must have. These are characteristics that a godly marriage, a good marriage, should have. And one of those is a deep love that overlooks each other's sins or offenses. And the scriptures in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 4. In this passage, it says, Peter the apostle says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Another translation says deeply. 
since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Verse 8 in particular, above all, keep loving one another. And that's in, in the Greek language, that's in a continuous tense. Keep loving one another. And so there's times when we need to make those decisions that though I might be feeling upset or whatever the situation may be, I will choose to keep showing my love, my unconditional love. Keep loving one another earnestly, deeply. Boy, that's an ingredient so, so desperately needed if we're going to have godly and good marriages, isn't it? And it says love covers a multitude of sins, which means that love is able to just overlook, if you will, the offenses against you when at others having a moment of weakness. And in a marriage relationship, we're all imperfect, right? In any relationship, we're all imperfect. I remember when I was first dating Vicki, I said to her, I know one thing for sure, I will always love you, and I do, and that grows over time. I love her intensely. But I told her, but I'm a human being, so I can't guarantee I won't make mistakes, okay? And we're all, we're all human, and we all make mistakes in our relationships. Love, though, covers a multitude of sins. Love overlooks those and continues to love and treat with respect. The next passage is from Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Characteristics, once again, desperately needed in our relationships. Familiar passage. The fruit of the Spirit. Paul says here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Interesting that, and, and I'm very glad it says the fruit of the Spirit which means these things which we can find so difficult, like I don't, you know, you might say, I don't feel like I'm very kind today, or I don't seem to have much joy, and, and certainly I don't have patience. Well, you know, these things are the fruit of the Spirit, which means when we're born again, when the Spirit of God regenerates us, He is working these things within us as He conforms us to the image of Christ. Therefore, we don't rely upon ourselves to be faithful, our own strength. We don't rely upon our own abilities. We don't have to spin our wheels and always trying to be patient. But what we do is we look to Christ as our ultimate example and in prayer in our hearts, we we'll rely upon the Holy Spirit, knowing that he is transformed forming us and empowering us to be more like Christ and to have the fruit of the Spirit come alive in our lives. It often doesn't happen fast enough when we're struggling with something, right? And say, oh, what am I doing wrong here? But I think if you look back, if you've been a believer for any number of years, you look back, you realize, you know something? I am growing. I am a little more patient than I was five years ago. I seem to be understanding kindness a whole lot more, and I'm knowing more of the joy and the peace of the Lord than I ever knew before. The Holy Spirit does and will produce these things in us. And then the, the uh, third scripture is the importance of understanding temptation and one's own limitations. That's vital. That scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Paul the Apostle, after giving an example out of the Old Testament, how, the, how at times the Jewish people, while wandering in the wilderness, had been unfaithful and fallen into sin and idolatry, he says to these believers, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. 
God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. The part I don't like is the endure it part. I wish it said escape it. <laughs> I mean, he provides a way of escape, but that way of escape is actually a way through it. And it's the, by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. But the key verse here, don't you who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Sometimes you'll hear newlyweds and they'll get all excited and say, I'll never be unfaithful. And um, let's hope that's true and let's hope that remains that way throughout your life. But never presume your own strength. Always rely on the strength that Jesus Christ gives. Because remember, we're human and by nature we are fallen and we have needed a savior and we still need a savior. I think one thing we need to do is if you can picture Christianity as this walk from the foot of the cross further and further into the presence of God. Illustrations are always weak. They always fall apart somewhere. But we always stand at the foot of the cross. We always stand there. We always need him in our frailty and humanity. And until that day when we are transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, when the Lord returns until that moment of the red, great resurrection, we will always desperately need our Savior. You who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. So in a marriage relationship, these things are so important. The love that you have for each other on an ongoing basis that overlooks sin. The fruit of the Spirit growing in your lives. And then the understanding that you don't stand in your own strength. Never presume anything. He is faithful who will hold on to you. But by nature, we have wandering hearts and we're not always faithful in our own strength. I think these are important things to remember in any relationship. The scripture, that passage that Joan had selected is from uh, Ephesians chapter 5, if you want to turn there, 5, 22 to 33. I'm going to read through these verses and comment on a couple of them. Verses 22 through 33. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to, in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that he might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. He said here that marriage is an exclusive relationship in which a man and a woman commit themselves to each other in a covenant for life. And on the basis of this solemn vow, they become, according to scripture, one flesh. It's an exclusive relationship, not only in the sense 
that you have an intimacy with this person that you have with no other human being on every level, whether physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological. It's also exclusive in the sense that that person is first in your life. Above your favorite sport, <laughs> above hunting, above whatever it is you're interested in, even above, ready for this? Books. Okay. <laughs> I love books, okay. So anyways, no matter what it is, that, other, that's, that spouse, husband and wife have full access to your heart. Just as we have no idols before God, we have no loves before our spouse. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy these things. We certainly can. And we respect each other and let each other enjoy the things we enjoy. That kind of freedom is so important. On the other hand, that, that person in my life is first before my chiefest joy. So it's one thing we need to keep in mind, and it is a covenant that we make. It is a vow that we make. We become one flesh, which is why Paul places an emphasis on loving your flesh. Because if you love your own body, you're going to love your spouse because you're now one flesh with that person. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Probably that would go down as one of the most abused scripture in church history. <laughs> I wrote down here, wives were to be voluntarily, and that's important to hear, wives were to be voluntarily submissive to their own husbands. It must be a voluntary submission based on mutual respect. No external coercion should ever be involved. No external coercion, like making somebody listen to you. And this is all in the context of Paul telling the whole church to be in submission to one another. So no external coercion should be involved, nor should submission ever imply that, this, that the wife somehow is a lesser partner in the marital union. You're equals in this marriage relationship. You're equals in it. And as two adults, you treat, you treat each other with a mutual respect. Nobody dominates the other. Jesus said to his disciples, do not be like the Gentiles who love to lord it over each other. Don't be like that. If you have a heart like that towards your spouse, you need to repent there's something wrong. Your equals. The submission of the wife is governed by the phrase, as to the Lord. The Christians' wives' submission to their husbands is one aspect of their obedience to Christ. Submission is patterned after Christ's example and reflects the essence of the gospel, doesn't it? It's Christ Jesus coming down in submission to the Father when he cries out in the garden that your will be done, not mine, that has gained us our eternal life. To be submissive is to be like Christ. Submission must distinguish the lifestyle of all Christians. Whether it's in the workplace, you're not going to grind your heels when your supervisor disagrees with you. You're going to be, have a submissive attitude. Doesn't mean you can't voice your opinions. In some workplaces you can't, but um, and, and many you can. It doesn't mean you don't have a will and something to say. But it does mean that when you're butting heads, you're not going to, you know, like I said, put your heels in the ground. You're going to have a, an attitude that's submissive. Verse 25, husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And notice what it says, gave himself up for her. Husbands are to love their wives that way, 
giving themselves up. I think this message, as I was reviewing it this, uh, this morning, actually for a little while, I was thinking this is a, a joyful message of God's redeeming love and the love that can be in a marriage, and it's also a very convicting message because I don't think any of us really reach that standard of totally giving themselves up <laughs> for another. We kind of want to hang on to our own things. This is a self-sacrificing love that gives of oneself for the benefit of the other person. You're willing to give up yourself for the benefit of that person. The emphasis in the passage is not the husband's authority to govern. It never is. Rather, it's on his responsibility to love. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. He laid down his life for the church. We are to lay down our lives for our spouses. In verse 26, it says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. I learned something interesting this week. I have this one commentary that's based on the culture and society at the time of Christ by um, Craig Keener. And what's interesting is at the time of a betrothal, um, the wife was said to be sanctified. They, in fact, the Jewish people at that time in their wedding tradition used the word sanctified meaning that person's set apart for me now. And it was usually, a betrothal could be any length of time. It could um, you know, be a year. Usually it was about a year. And it's kind of like what we would call today an engagement. So interestingly, they used the word as part of that as, as sanctify. That person set apart for me. And then on the wedding morning, the woman was washed and bathed and anointed with oils. And so... I think Paul is kind of borrowing from the culture a little bit with the use of his language to sanctify and to wash. Only this time in, a, in our relationship with the Lord, we're set apart by the Holy Spirit, washed by the word of God, the proclamation of the gospel. Now, I'm not going to say this as, as a matter of fact, but... I can't help but to think that maybe in all of our debates as to what it means to be washed by the word, does it mean baptism or does it not mean baptism, maybe all of that was just futile after all. <laughs> maybe Paul is just simply alluding to the culture of his time of washing, of bathing, and preparation for the ceremony. And it's by the proclamation of the word. We're washed by the word. But I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not... Speaking at ex cathedra out of the chair. <laughs> okay. Um, and the next verse I'd like to look at is verse 27. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, or a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. People, God's great salvation for us on the cross. His great salvation is to cleanse us totally and that we would be without blemish and without spot. That's, that's amazing. How, how do we, imperfect human beings that we are, and having sinned gravely at times, how do we come into the presence of an almighty, eternal, and perfectly holy God who can countenance no sin? How does that happen? God even told Moses, no man can see me and live. It would kill you. God is perfect, eternal, and infinite holiness. The cross of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross was so complete that in our redemption and in our union with him, we will be able to go into the immediate presence of God in, and we will see as Jesus prayed in John 17 to see his glory that he had with the Father before the world was ever made. And according to Revelation 22, 4, we'll be able to gaze into his face, something the angels don't even do. They cover their faces. Wow. That is a complete sacrifice. Oftentimes I'll hear people, Christians, talk about 
the suffering that the church must go through in order to be without spot and without wrinkle. I said, wait a second. It was completed on the cross in our all-sufficient Savior. Jesus Christ, through that sacrifice, will bring us there. It's his work of redemption. It's not my work. He certainly chastens us to conform us to the image of Christ in this life. But that kind of perfection before his throne comes alone through the cross. And that's how wonderful the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is and how complete it is. He's the all-sufficient Savior. Our salvation is by God, by grace, through faith, plus nothing. Can't be our own merits. Can't be our own works. Can't be according to our own deservings. People say, well, I don't deserve God's forgiveness. You are absolutely right. None of us do. <laughs> it's a gift. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Verse 28 in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And he who loves him, um, his wife loves himself. This is a love that's based on the one flesh relationship of husband and wife. I alluded to it before. You're going to respect and take care of your own body. Treat your spouse the same way. In verse 29... For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Listen to this. This is so cool. It says in this verse that the Lord cherishes his church. A lot of times in marriage vows, we vow to cherish our spouse. The Bible says that Jesus cherishes his redeemed people, those who have placed their faith in him. That he's, he cherishes them. That's profound. Christ cherishes us. The relationship between husband and wife should, should reflect this kind of love and cherishing, and it should be a loud message to our lost and dying world. People should see in a Christian marriage, ideally, as we grow, they should see what it is that of, the, of the love of God and the love he has for his redeemed and the love that's in that marriage. I know I'm speaking ideals here, but that's exactly what God wants to work in us. That we would be to the praise of his glory by what he works within us. Okay, verse 30. Because we are members of his body. I wrote down here, what a profound truth. Believers are totally united to Christ. This union with Christ is something we can't even begin to comprehend. What it basically says is Jesus Christ comes to those who are lost in sin. He comes to a dying world in darkness. He comes to those separated from Almighty God and he joins them through his sacrifice on the cross. He joins them to himself and makes them one with himself. And that's, you talk about an incredible security and sense of safety that by faith in Christ, we're brought into union with him, which is why the Apostle Paul over and over and over uses those words in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This is a union. It's a union that is even like between a husband and a wife. Just think of how much God loves us that he would want to have that kind of a relationship with us, bringing us into union with himself. He's not your judge if you belong to him. You're in union with him. He treats you as a spouse, and he cherishes you. Christ has joined the church to himself through the bonds of the covenant that he fulfilled. He fulfilled the covenant. If you want to look at one difference between the covenant of grace in the Old Testament and, in the, and how it expands and blossoms in the New Testament, in the New Testament, our representative head, Jesus Christ, the new Adam, has fulfilled and obeyed the covenant perfectly in our place. So Jesus Christ, through the bonds of the covenant he fulfilled, has joined himself, has joined the church to himself. 
And this intimate union forms an analogy for Christian marriage. The last couple of verses here, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. That's a quote from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. God's original purpose for marriage as set forth in Genesis was meant to reveal something of what his plan would be, his re great redemptive plan to ultimately unite mankind to himself. So telling Adam and Eve they were to be one flesh was to illustrate something, reveal something to us of the great plan of redemption that God had in mind, that in the greatest intimacy possible with any creature, God would have a redeemed people that he brings into union with himself. And people, that's an intimacy and a love that is to go on forever and ever and ever. Sometimes you wonder, what's heaven going to be like? What's, what is all of this about? I, none of us are ever going to know all about it it's just, it's, until we get there. It's, I mean, it's, the Bible does reveal some things, but this much we know. Bottom line is that God has saved us for himself. To have a bride, to have a people that will gaze into his face and have the deepest intimacy with him forever and ever and ever. Between a husband and wife, there's an, there's an openness and a freedom and a nakedness in a sense that you can share emotionally and psychologically with that other person, being totally free with them. Now, those, we have limitations in this life because of our fallen nature, but God has called us to have a, a, a relationship with him of total exposure in, 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 a, in, an, in an intimacy and in a speaking with him and, and him revealing himself and more of himself to us. An eternal relationship face to face with the living God for our good and his glory. Paul concludes and says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Those words alone are very convicting. <laughs> and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So Paul brings us to a, con uh, to a conclusion. Love and respect are absolutely necessary for a godly and healthy marriage. And only Christ, through the fruit of the Spirit, can empower this kind of lifestyle. It's a redemptive work of Almighty God, and it's one He wills and desires to do. Praise God. What we're going to do is we're going to have Ken and Joan come forward. They're going to be renewing their vows with each other. And uh, so Ken and Joan, if you want to come forward.
a few days ago, he down, got down on his knees when he had a gift for me, and he said, we knew Mary you, so <laughs> it's official. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> shows how much I have grown in securities and uh, questions I had when we first did get married and I wasn't sure of anything and I uh, didn't like to hear the word no. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, as first we were married, I did notice that Joan's got one of the best memories. <laughs> she can remember when I didn't pick the baby up when he was crying, when we didn't put the crib in the trunk, what she was wearing when she was pregnant, <laughs> <laughs> and what the girls were wearing when they went to school that first day. But all in all, I've learned throughout the time, people will ask me, well, what's your secret? And I said, those three little words you've got to say over and over and over again. Yes, dear. <laughs> okay, I am so sorry. <laughs> I will never do it again. <laughs> and that certainly does help. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, we're going to um, have the renewal of vows now. Joan and Ken both wrote their own vows out, and um, and we will start, uh, Joan. <laughs> okay, to Ken. <laughs> You've always been a good husband, father, and provider. I couldn't have asked for someone more loyal than you are. <coughs> Thank you for always being there. <coughs> During our marriage, we've had our laughs and our cries. We've had our ups, our downs, and our in-betweens. But above all else, we've always had love for each other. That brings to mind the scripture at 1 Corinthians 13, 7 through 8, which says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and bears all things. Love never ends, or as some translations put it, love never fails. And because we have that in unconditional love, our marriage will never fail. Another scripture that comes to mind is that Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, where it says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one person alone keep warm? And if somebody overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. When two believers are joined in holy love and fellowship, Christ by his spirit will come to them. Then there is a threefold cord. So in the presence of God, family and friends, Love, respect, and yes, you have a failure as long as you both shall live. and I look at you and I see all the things that made me love you even more than ever. I am glad we have kept the promises we made 50 years ago. I appreciate the trust and sense of security I get from our loving commitment. 
also the warmth and honesty as we share ourselves with each other means so much to me. I love you more as the years go by because you are my loving partner, my precious wife. You are the woman I would marry over and over again. So today I renew my love, friendship, and marriage commitment. I am yours forever. Join our hearts together and just pray God's blessing on Ken and Joan and on their marriage relationship. God, our Heavenly Father, together we pray that you would continue to shield and bless this marriage relationship, Lord. Deepen their intimacy. Give them many joyful moments together and strengthen the difficult times. Father, cause your face to shine upon them. Let them know your favor, your grace always in Christ. And I pray that together, as they are heirs together of the kingdom of God, that, Heavenly Father, they would grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And someday together, standing before your throne, be awed by you as they stand hand in hand. Father, bless them, Lord. Keep them, shield and protect them, we pray. Enrich their marriage, Lord. And be glorified in their lives, we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We've got a song, and then we're going to have a communion service. <laughs> Yeah. 
Beautiful, Kim, thank you. We're going to have a communion service, and um, what I'd like to do is read the passage of Scripture. We'll do it a little bit different than usual. And um, we're going to have Ken and Joan actually give communion to each other first, and then we'll have communion for everybody else. Um, the way we practice communion is if um, communion is for those who, as disciples of Jesus Christ, um, have committed their lives to him and know they are in full union with Christ, the kind of union we were talking about in, in the message. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, united with Christ, you're more than welcome to celebrate this broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ with us in the communion. Passage of scripture is from 1 Corinthians 11. Paul the apostle said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also he took the cup after supper. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What a gospel message, and that's what we celebrate in the communion. That Jesus shed his blood, poured out his life, so that we could have life. And uh, Joan and Ken, if you'll come forward.
Now receive together, and remember, this is not only the seal of our faith, looking back at what Christ has done, but it's also the promise that we'll be inheritors of his kingdom, and at one, someday at last, sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Christ has died, he has risen, and he is coming again. Receive the bread. And the juice. God, our Father, we thank you for the tremendous sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He himself said, the good shepherd. He goes, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He is the good shepherd. He's laid down his life. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Father, we thank you for this. Praise you. And ask that you be glorified in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll close by singing the doxology, so if you'll stand.